We're talking about the God of the impossible. We're in Judges chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. You follow along with me. Early in the morning, Zerubbabel, that is Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many men for me to deliver Midian into their hands, in order that Israel may not boast against me that her own strength has saved her. Announce now to the people, Anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left, while 10,000 remained. But the Lord said to Gideon, There are still too many. Take them down to the water, and I will sift them for you there. If I say, This one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say, This one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, Separate those who lap the water with their tongues like a dog from those who kneel down to drink. Three hundred men lapped with their hands to their mouths. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, With the three hundred men that, I, that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the other men go, each to his own place. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites to their tents, but kept the three hundred who took over the provisions and trumpets of the others. Let's pray. Dear precious Father, we thank you for your word. We ask that you would open our hearts and minds to it, that it may illuminate the truths intended to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Familiar story, Gideon. Hopefully you remember that from Sunday school. I, I, I do think those things, uh, that turn of that phrase, that everything I needed to know I learned in Sunday school when I was a child about the Bible. So. We've heard the story of Gideon, and I'm going to recount part of it for you. First off, the Midianites had taken over the land. And the Bible refers to them in chapter 6 as being like a swarm of locusts. And if you've ever seen uh, pictures of that or videos, you know that the locusts just blacken the sky. There are so many of them. And so the Midianites, along with some Amalekites and some other armies, had taken over the land, and it says that God had given them into the land, given them possession of the land because of the sin of the Israelites. They had turned away from God. And we call Gideon a judge. There were 12 judges in the book of the book of Judges. And judge means a little different back then than it does in our mind today. A judge, the Hebrew word, is shofet, and it was actually a military leader or, and a fighter. And the word directly means ruler. So it was somebody who was over the people to marshal them to action. So Gideon was a judge. And these are the 12 judges listed there in the book of Judges. And not all of them rose to as much prominence as Gideon. Deborah is one that uh, may be well known to you, Jephthah. And, of course, Samson, who was the final judge. The uh, other, after these judges, came Samuel, who was a prophet judge. And he was the, the, the line of the last judges there. So the Midianites had overtaken the land. That was the situation. The people cried out to God, as they often did. Matter of fact, there's a cycle of sin that takes place in the book of Judges. And these seven, these, there are seven cycles in the book. Seven times the Israelites went through this. But it goes through this order. They first, God delivers them, just as he had delivered them so many times. And in the first part of chapter 6, God reminds them how he had delivered them from Egypt. He had brought them out. He had freed them from the oppression of the Egyptians, and yet they had turned away from them. They started sinning. They started worshiping false idols. And so God, in order to get their attention, lets them become oppressed. This was typically done by an army that would come in. And the Midianites had been ruling over this area for seven years. And the Bible tells us that they would observe. And whenever crops would come in, whenever things would start going well for the Israelites, 
they would come in and they would destroy the crops, take all the, 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 the livestock, and put the people back in poverty again. So this is going over and over. And so Israel then decides they need to cry out to God for help. And they cry out to him. They who had turned away from him, had gone their own ways, realize they need God to come to their deliverance. And God in his mercy of grace raises up a judge to, to deliver the people from their oppressor. And then they go into this other cycle of being delivered and enjoying God's benefits again. So Gideon was raised up, and as the judge we're talking about today, Gideon's father was Joash. Joash was actually one of the guilty because Joash had an altar to Baal, uh, the pagan god of that area, and he had an Asherah pole. And so Joash was no, uh, no uh, example to Gideon, and we find Gideon in a wine press. And I was sharing this with the ladies at Twin Oaks this week, ladies and gentlemen. They have one thorn among the roses. And I was reminding them of the show that you've probably seen, you old timers like me especially, the Lucille Ball Show. And if you remember one time, Lucy got involved in wine pressing. You remember her being down in the vat, stomping around, and first off, she's feeling the ooze through her toes, and she does that Lucy ball thing, yee, like that. But then she starts liking it. She starts having fun treading the grapes. Well, that's where Gideon was. He was in a wine press like that. And part of the distinction that, that doesn't come through the Scripture, but we know from culture, is wine presses were down in the valley usually, because they carried the grapes from the vineyard down. They didn't want to carry them up the hill, so they would carry them downhill. So your wine press would be down in a valley, down in the lower part of the terrain, whereas Gideon was in there threshing wheat. Wheat was threshed up on the hill because the way they cleared the chaff was they would throw the wheat into the air and they would let the wind blow the chaff away to get down to the kernel that they used to make flour and to cook with. So that's part of the extra picture of what Gideon's doing here. One, he's in a wine press. He's in a wine press to, to hide what he's doing from the Midianites. If they saw him, if they knew he had grain, they would come and either destroy it or steal it or take it away. So he doesn't want them to see it. So he's down in the wine press but in order to get it up into the air, he's having to take some kind of a pitchfork and throw it up into the air to where the wind can catch the chaff and blow it away. So it's extra work, it's extra trouble. And he wasn't being cowardly. We could imagine he was down there being cowardly, but it's really just self-perseverance that in order to keep this grain, in order to feed his family, he needed to keep it out of the sight of the Midianites, so he's in this wine press down in the valley having to work extra hard in order to, to get the wheat, and that's where we find him. Gideon's name means hewer, as in to hew a tree, or it can mean feller, not a fellow, but a feller, a feller of trees, to fell a tree is what his name means. Well, an angel shows up, angel of the Lord, and and many scholars believe this was the Lord himself shown up, taking personage to talk to Gideon. And he calls him a mighty warrior. And that's interesting in the fact there, because here he's, he's hiding him from the Midianites for good reason, but he's down in the wine press, he's working, he's trying not to be seen. And this angel of the Lord calls him a mighty warrior. And we should take note of that, that God sees what we don't, even about ourselves. God can see within us a warrior spirit when we don't think we're up to the task. So, so that's how we find Gideon, and the situation is these Midianites, these armies have taken over the land, but they're, they did that because of the, their being, they were oppressed because the Israelites had sinned against God. And God used this deliverance time and again, seven times through the book of Judges to deliver his people by raising up a leader. And he raised up 
Gideon for this case. He gives Gideon a challenge, a task, initially in chapter 6, if, if, when you read these two chapters, to tear down the altar of Baal that his father had erected and to tear down the Asherah pole. And so he goes out at night, he takes some friends with him, and he does do that at night because he was concerned what the townspeople would do if they caught him tearing down the Baal, and he's proven right for that concern. So he goes in, he tears down the altar, he cuts down the Asherah pole, he cuts it into pieces, and he uses that on an altar God has him build to him, to Jehovah, to do a sacrifice on of a bull. And God sends down a fire, it laps everything up. Well, the next morning the people get up and they see that the altar is torn down. They see the Asherah pole is cut down and they are very incensed. They're angry. They want to know who did this. And they find out it was Gideon. And so they go to get him. But here his father stands up for him and he says something really wise. He said, look, why are you having to defend Baal? If Baal is this powerful God, if he's this God, period, then he can take care of himself. You don't need to come against Gideon. And the people listened to him and they went off. So there Gideon shows us a faith in God and a valor that he has that God obviously had seen that he was willing to obey and he was willing to tear down this altar to a pagan little g God so that and worship Jehovah God. So some time passes and the Midianites are in the land, and God then calls him to rally the troops, as it were, to muster an army in order to go against the Midianites. And so he sounds the trumpet to the local townspeople. He was from the town of Ophrah. Uh, interesting enough, we have an Ophrah with us today. And, and uh, Gideon was from the town of Ophrah in the tribe of Manasseh. And he sounds a trumpet, and the people respond. And it, uh, by the numbers we can read, he got 32,000 to respond. Sounds like a good-sized army, but it was still nothing against the Midianites. But as we read, God said, that's too many people. They'll think if the, when the battle is won, they'll think they did the work. They won the battle. God says, I don't want them to do that. You tell them if they're scared, if they don't really want to be here, it's okay go on home. So 22,000 leave, leaves him 10,000, a third of what he had to go against this swarm of locusts of an army. God says, that's still too many. And so he develops this test for them to find out who God wants to keep. And it tells us that some went down to the river and they took their hand, they would cup some water, bring it up to their mouth and lap it. As a, as a dog is what it says, which doesn't sound very complimentary. The others would get down on their knees and stick their face in the river and drink. And some scholars, some preachers have made a point, the Bible doesn't say this, but that the reason behind that was very strategic is that those who brought their hand of water up to their mouth were able to keep an eye out for safety to make sure those who had knelt down, stuck their face in the river, wouldn't see an enemy coming. And so perhaps that was part of, of God's reasoning. I think God just knew what would happen and used that to call them down to 300 people, a tenth of what he started with, and they were to go against this massive army. And so God takes these people, but then God gives them something else crazy to do. These were not, the Israelites were not soldiers. They were not warrior people. They were farmers. They were herders. And so they would have had to try to gain what weapons they could, sharp sticks, or maybe they made some bows and arrows, but they, they were not outfitted to be a, an army. But God says, don't do that anyway. They take the provisions of the other man, and all the 300 men get a trumpet, and they get a jar and they get a torch. And they go around where the Midianites are encamped at night and they go all around them and they have the torch in the jar and they have their trumpet. And Gideon tells them, when I give you the, the command, 
you blow the trumpet and you break the torch. But God did something before that. Gideon, of course, is kind of concerned about the battle. He's kind of wondering what's going on. So he goes down into the camp and he's, he's outside one of the tents. He hears a couple of men talking. And one of them tells about a dream about a loaf of bread that rolls down and, and wipes out the people. And the other one says, this can mean nothing else than their God is going to do battle for them. So God is instilling in their hearts this fear, this trepidation, this worry about their God, the Israelites' God, being with them and being behind them. One of the things that's important for us to realize in that day was the people had a concept of a very nationalistic God. In other words, the Israelite, Jehovah, was the Israelites' God. Then the other peoples, the other nations, would have their God. And so they would see that, in this case, that Israel's God, Jehovah, was going to do battle against their God. They didn't have this concept of monotheism, that there was only one God and no one else is God. So they, they're, God is instilling this fear in them. So the next night, Gideon takes the people. They're surrounding the tribe, the, the camp. And at the sound, Gideon gives them, they start blowing the trumpet. And if it surrounds you, it's making a horrendous noise. And then they break the jars. And so all the torches suddenly light up. And this Midianite army, already scared, already worried about the battle, they end up being in a state of terror, and they turn on each other, and they actually kill each other. And the Israelites didn't have to do nearly as much. They essentially wiped themselves out. But the Israelites did pursue them and did go after the remaining to finish them off. So this is how God does this. This is how God leads them in battle and how he accomplishes the battle. And those 300 men, I have no doubt that some of them, when Gideon has given them this instruction, are going, this man's crazy. This is dumb. This is never going to work. We need to have a real general. We need to get somebody in here with military experience. We need to get a leader who will muster the men and give us weapons. We need to go in with the might of force. But they followed Gideon. They did what he said, and they won the battle. God makes the impossible situation more impossible by reducing the number to 300 and by having them not carry weapons, but carry a torch, a jar, and a trumpet. But they prevail. So God gave them this outlandish strategy, but it worked because God was with them, because God enabled them to have the victory. And after that time, after they rousted the Midianites and the other armies, they enjoyed 40 years of peace. Their peace lasted as long as Gideon. They tried to make Gideon a king. He didn't want to be king. He refused it. He did set up an altar, and the people lived in peace for 40 years. Another fantastic story from the Bible, another one easy to write off as a myth, as hyperbole. I, I don't. I believe the Bible from cover to cover. I believe God did what was said and what was written down, but why would God do this? We have to understand what's important to God. God wasn't really worried about the battle. God knew he could take care of it right away. God didn't need any of the Israelites at all. He could have struck the Midianites with a plague. He could have had uh, snakes show up to bite them all and kill them. God could have done it any number of ways. He chose to go this way because the most important thing to God is the faith of his people. He wants to develop faith, in this case in the Israelites, but he wants to develop a deep faith in us to where we trust him 
in every situation, even to do the crazy things that he calls us to do like he did the Israelites. It took faith for them to go into battle as they did with the trumpets and the torches. They had to trust that God was going to bring them the victory because it didn't make any sense. It wasn't good military strategy. It was downright foolish. But they obeyed God, and God gave them the victory. God wants to build up our faith. And he wanted them to know it was God who provided. He wants us to know it's God who provides. God's main desire for the Israelites and ourselves is that deep faith in Him. He knows if we have that deep trust in Him, relying on Him for everything we need, turning to Him, that everything will be provided. He's promised to do that. He's going to do that. And so we can count on Him providing for us. So we don't have to stress over the cares of the day, about the provisions. Yes, we have to do the work to get it, but God provides. He gives us a job. He gives us the strength. He gives us the help. He gives us the knowledge in order to do this. But it comes from trusting Him, and that's God's desire for us not to worry about these things. So God allows us into impossible situations so that he can be magnified and our faith deepened. He will deliver us or bring us victory when we trust and obey. He does these for our sake. God says in Malachi, he still does it today. God tells in Malachi, I the Lord do not change. The God that was with the Israelites those thousand years ago, they're coming against the battle of the Midianites is the same God that we have with us today. He is the same God. Hebrews 13, 8 tells us Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. And we know that yesterday was not 2,000 plus years ago when he was born as a baby. Yesterday is from the start of time, from creation. The Bible teaches us that Jesus was there at the creation and the creation was done through him. So Jesus has always existed. He is eternal, just like Almighty Father God, just like the Holy Spirit. And he is the same today as he was back when creation happened. So we have those promises of God. I don't change. And so what I said, what I taught back then, is still true today. What I've said I would do years ago, I will keep that word and I will support you. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We have that promise. We have those promises of God. God delivered the Israelites and gave them the victory as the same God who will deliver you, who will deliver us and give us victory if we do as the Israelites do if we trust and obey in how he tells us to do things, to not rely on our own wisdom. That great verse in Proverbs chapter 3, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy paths. God, over and over again, is instilling in us this truth of trust him, obey him, because he is the supreme, all-knowing God. He loves us. He wants the best for us. He wants us with him in heaven after we die. And to do that, we have to repent. We have to accept his son, Jesus Christ, as our Savior and Lord. We have to accept his redemptive work on the cross in order to get that. God wants us there with him. And he's provided the way but he's left it up to us to accept the way or to refuse it. He gives us that. Trust is having faith in God. When you came in here today, I didn't see anybody 
check out the structural soundness of the pew you're in. And that might not have been the wisest thing. Some have been known to bend a little bit. But you trusted it. You came in and you sat down. That's what trust in God is. It's not checking Him out. It's not trying to prove Him. It's believing His Word and resting completely on Him. Obedience is demonstrating that faith in God. It's easy to have lip service and say, I trust in God, but when He calls us to do something, we say, oh, I don't know. It reminds me of a, of a Richard Pryor story. He, he, uh, I can't do the whole thing, certainly not like he do it. He's the professional comedian. But he goes, I was walking down the street, and the Lord said to me, turn into this field. So I turned into the field because it might have been the voice of the Lord. And I was walking along and the Lord said, walk up to the cliff. So I walked up to the cliff because it might have been the voice of the Lord. And the voice of the lad said, jump off this cliff for I will catch you. But I did not jump off that cliff because it might not have been the voice of the Lord. And that's too often how we do in life. We trust when it's easy. We trust when we can see the outcome. We trust when we believe we can handle it. But when God says, take this step, and it's a step that makes no sense to us, it's a step we fear, we go, well, maybe that's not God talking. And so that obedience is taking that trust and putting it into action. And that's what God calls us to do. The question is not, is God able? The question is, will I trust Him and obey where He leads? There is that phrase, I've talked about it before, you know it, where there's a will, there's a way. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth and the life. And He goes on and says, no man comes to the Father but by Me. God, of course, can bend us to His will. He, can, he could make every one of us accept Jesus Christ as Savior, go through the motions. But He has instilled in us that, that free will, that ability to choose Him or reject Him. He has provided everything. But when we accept Him as Savior and Lord, He enters us through the power of the Holy Spirit. He indwells us. He gives us wisdom, knowledge, strength to do as He calls us to do. To step off the cliff. When He says, step off the cliff, He also says, my sheep know my voice. They hear me. They know my voice. As we are one of His, we will know when He is speaking and when He is not speaking. But He is there. He is the way. And as we exercise that will to trust in Him, when we love because He first loved us, He cherishes that love, He cherishes that faith, and He rewards it. There's one other thing we can draw from this Scripture, is those 300 men. Those 300 men who surely had some worries, some anxiety. They wouldn't be human if they didn't wonder about the orders they were given. But by obeying, they were part of this tremendous victory. They later did have to chase down the Midianites. They did have to complete the task, but they were blessed by seeing God work. The rest of the nation would hear the stories. The rest of the nation could celebrate vicariously, but those 300 men could say, I was there. You wouldn't believe it how they turned and they took one sword and turned it on their, their fellow soldier and they, they wiped themselves out. We just stood there watching. So they received a blessing because they were willing to follow God, to honor Him, to obey Him. And that was a benefit to them. Yes, they were freed from the oppression of the Midianites, but individually they can say, I have seen the hand of God. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. 
God doesn't change. And he is calling us today. You have an impossible situation in your life. I don't know the situation, but I know because you're alive and human today, you have some impossible situation facing you. And if you don't, don't be happy about that because it's coming. God is calling you to some action. He's calling you to trust him in that impossible situation. And he may tell you to do some crazy things. It may not make any sense to you. But as you trust and obey, you will receive the blessing and say, I have seen the hand of God. God is calling this church to some impossible situations, some tasks that are bigger than us, some tasks we say we can't do. But just like those Israelites that God called to, to go against the Midianites, God will provide for us to accomplish the task he has given us. We can trust in that as they trusted in him. God is still calling to the impossible from each and every one and from his body of believers because God is still trying to deepen our faith in him. That is still what he's looking for, still what he desires. And as we do that, we can be assured that he is going to pour out the blessings upon us. So the challenge for you today is to search your heart, to search God's mind, to let him speak. You may have multiple impossible situations. I know I was that place in life one time. I had too many things that I needed to do that I knew God wanted. And I went into what I call fibrillation. You know, fibrillation is where the heart doesn't beat right and it just kind of quivers. And you can die because it's not, it needs that steady pumping. So as a person, I was in fibrillation because I was stressing over all the things I needed to do for God. And then finally, in a moment of clarity, I heard God say, let me tell you the one to address. And so he gave me what was important to him to address in my life, the impossible situation he wanted to resolve. And I trusted him and followed him in that. And then he showed me the next one and the next one. And that is walking with him day by day, trusting him, living in him, believing in him for your impossible situation. God is still calling you to deepen your faith in him. That's what he's wanting out of each and every one of us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our most precious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. Lord, I thank you for the truth that you don't change, that you are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Because, Lord, I know you're not going to shift streams on me. I know you're not going to be wishy-washy. I know you're not a God of confusion. You know what you're calling me to. You know what you're calling each one of here to. So Lord, I pray for myself and for each one here that you would lead us to trust you and obey in our impossible situation so that we can say, I have seen the hand of God. He reigns supreme today. And we can trust you deeper and you can trust us with bigger impossible situations because you know we will trust and obey you. Father, that's my prayer for each one here today. And it is through Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.